Hello, my name's Julie Leesk, and it's a pleasure to be talking to you about what we've learned in relation to improving vaccination rates using behavioural science. So I'm going to uh, be talking about what influences vaccination behaviour, how we can address low coverage um, through some of the interventions at the behavioural level, at the community level, and uh, I'll focus a little bit on addressing misinformation as well. So we know that, that vaccines have brought such success in disease control the eradication of smallpox, declared eradicated in 1980, um, through to the um, beginning of or the eradication of polio in the 50s with a vaccine that at the time was a, a very new technology like our COVID-19 vaccine is now. And yet um, polio has nearly been eradicated. It remains in only a, a, a couple of countries. And now we have the promise of having better control of COVID-19. It's not going to take it away. We'll be living with it for many years, but we'll able, be able to um, have much better control of it once we see substantial proportions of people vaccinated. Uh, and that will um, add to the family of strategies that will control COVID-19. And this image is from Nepal. Um, beginning its vaccination program in late January. We've also got some challenges. So this graph shows childhood vaccination coverage globally. And the, the, the line here shows that we've stagnated in the last 10 years at around 85% globally. Um, and this is in relation to children receiving their third dose of diphtheria, tetanus and pertussis vaccine. Um, and we also had in 2018, 20 million children just under who were either unvaccinated or not, not fully vaccinated, what we call under vaccinated. So we've got some challenges still, and they relate to issues around access to healthcare, as you can see with these images on the right, but also other things. It's complicated. And we often, um, assume why children aren't fully vaccinated uh, and jump in with our solutions that don't actually match the causes. And that can be a problem if you're really wanting to achieve change. So understanding the causes of that coverage gap is essential. And that's a lot of the work in immunisation uptake research in social and behavioural science and immunisation but also in looking at interventions, which I'll focus on in a moment. So I'll give you my country, Australia, as an example, where when we were able to measure these factors very um, well, we had at the time 92% of children fully vaccinated for their age, but there was this gap. That gap was accounted for, very crudely speaking, by about 60% who faced practical issues. So the parents or caregivers wanted to vaccinate their children, but they faced a whole range of practical logistical barriers to getting their children vaccinated. They might have related to services, they might have related to transport, they might have related to um, uh, affordability of the vaccination visit, for example. Many, many different things, providers, falsely contraindicating vaccination in a child who might have just been a bit unwell at the time. And then the other group are those where parents faced motivational barriers. And this is the group where we're thinking about vaccine refusal, um, partial vaccine refusal, uh, people whose beliefs about healthcare or their beliefs about vaccination or their bad experiences with the system or just their hypervigilance in relation to vaccination caused them to delay, refuse um, some or all vaccines for their children. So even in a country like Australia, we can't just assume that it's healthcare services are, um, are nailed, are dealt with, and that it's only about attitudinal barriers. It's that it's only about what goes on in the heads of people. And that's why the, the, the 
the, the phrase vaccine hesitancy, while relevant to some people who are unsure about vaccination, shouldn't apply to everybody. Um, and that we need to use precision with our explanatory language around low vaccination rates. And what's even more telling is if you look at what the systematic reviews show improve coverage. And this, um, and I'm going to show you some of the things that have been, well, the, the things that have been shown through systematic reviews to improve coverage in children. This mostly comes from randomised trials in high income countries. And at the individual level, uh, both um, reminder and recall systems work, as do implementation intentions, which is a, a behavioural approach where you ask someone to state the um, time and date that they are going to um, have an appointment, for example. So you get people to be very practical in their plan. Home visits work because they bring vaccination to homebound people who may really struggle to access the service if they've got a big family, if they're not, not sure how to access the health system because it's not their country of birth. Provide a support assessment feedback and reminders work. Um, and that's why being able to document vaccination in an individual is so important because it enables the provider to do that recommendations from providers work, standing orders to enable a suitably qualified person to vaccinate uh, each time, um, on-site vaccination and combining interventions work. And that's also the case at a community level. No, there's no one, usually no one single magic, you know, wand you can wave and change vaccination rates. It requires multiple interventions. And requirements for school or child care entry work, as do incentives and reducing cost. But requirements need to be implemented with care um, because they, um, um, they often come with consequences for not vaccinating, which may affect the education or welfare of the child or family as well. So uh, what about COVID-19 vaccine? Well, we've seen... Um, already, we're able to look at um, doses uh, distributed, and this is an estimate from Worldometer of the share of people who received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine globally by March the 13th. Uh, some countries, like in with these countries, African countries in grey, have no have reported no data. And that may either be because they have not yet started vaccinating or they're simply not reporting their coverage. Um, but there are other countries like Israel, which is reaching nearly 60% of coverage for a single dose, uh, and the UK, which is doing quite well as well. So we've got a long way to go, both in terms of global equity and in terms of reaching all populations within a nation to um, ensure that we have very high protection against COVID-19. There has been a lot of work done in the past to look at what improves coverage in adults. And what has been found, this is usually through influenza vaccination uptake research, both in adults generally and also in healthcare workers, that again, that finding again, on-site vaccination works. And this image on the right is called or Salisbury Cathedral, where they were providing vaccination to citizens to be able to come in. Um, incentives work, free and affordable vaccines and healthcare um, and, in, and services. Institutional recommendations, provider recommendations and reminder and recall. And this review was also looking at strategies at, um, to uh, in, improve attitudes to vaccination and knowledge and found that educational campaigns, message framing and vaccine champions also work. So again, um, the, the reviews show that the more components you have in your strategy to improve coverage, the higher the vaccination, um, the, the, the greater the change you'll get the higher, the, the bigger the change in vaccination rates. 
So what about COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy? We, we talk a lot about this. Um, what does it mean? Well, uh, we've sort of positioned hesitancy here as a motivational state of being concerned or about vaccination, of being unsure whether to vaccinate or not. It's not a behaviour. Um, so there are people who are hesitant and it's very important that their concerns are addressed. Substantial proportions of populations right now, ranging from anything from about 60% through to 10%, are unsure whether they'll have the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, for the people who are planning to reject the vaccine, it's very important that the, their trust is maintained and those bridges are built, um, that, that providers don't abandon them to that decision, but keep talking with them, keep the conversation going and recommend vaccination, even if they're planning to not have it. Um, it's more effective if rapport is built with the person before that recommendation comes in, particularly if they're more resistant to vaccination. There are a small, vocal, globally active group of anti-vaccination activists, and they garner a lot of, they make a lot of noise, they get a lot of attention, um, they have variable impacts, sometimes substantial, sometimes not. Um, but it's important that we think strategically about how to minimise their impact. They won't go away. Um, so strategic thinking about their impact is important here. For people who are accepting vaccination, maintaining good consent processes is important. For people who are um, demanding vaccination right now, there's the challenge that we face right now of man managing those various expectations. And for people who are great advocates for vaccination, supporting their advocacy with tools and resources so they can go out and address concerns and recommend vaccination and influence their networks. Misinformation has been a big concern with COVID-19 generally and with COVID-19 vaccination. It ranges from the very striking, maybe sometimes conspiratorial, through to um, pointing out, say, inconsistencies, to making points about what the best way to maintain health might be. It's not through vaccination, it's through um, fresh food and fresh air and sunshine. Um, through to just simply pointing out past failures or perceived failures um, that have strong sort of cultural or historical meaning and lumping vaccines with those failures. So how do we respond to misinformation? Well, first of all, it's important to strategically respond because there can often be um, a tendency to respond to it too reflexively or too early, not knowing whether it's actually influencing behaviour. So is it being shared a lot? Is it affecting actual behaviour or does it have the potential to? Is it being shared by influential people? And all of these tips are in the COVID-19 vaccine communication handbook. If it is and if it's important to respond, then we, we recommend what we call psychological inoculation which is to give people small doses of the opposing view. Let them know. You might hear people say this or that and describe what they might hear and then give them the facts. And give the facts by starting with the fact, the thing you want people to remember, warning them they're going to hear the fallacy, sharing with them the fallacy and ending with the facts. And do that rapidly because if you leave communication gaps for too long, others will fill them. And it's harder to change people once they've started to shape their views. Use trusted spokespeople or organisations. Play the issue, not the opponent. Um, so in communities, a lot has been learned. There have been some very successful approaches with communities where vaccination rates might have been quite low. 
Um, and tailoring immunisation programs is an approach developed by WHO Europe, which looks at, first of all, planning and understanding the community with members of that community at the planning table, and that's crucial. Doing research, usually qualitative, to better understand why people aren't vaccinating, what the issues are for them. And often there are surprises in that process. It can often challenge the assumptions of health authorities. Designing interventions to address those issues in collaboration with the communities and implementing and evaluating them. And TIP has been used in many countries, including just three here, Stockholm with the Somali community who had concerns about MMR and autism. In Maitland, Australia, a very disadvantaged community, it wasn't hesitancy there, it was access to services. And in um, the Haredi Jewish community, in Hackney in London, um, where a lot of work was done with the community and the religious leader to address various issues around vaccination services in particular. So in summary, <coughs> there are a whole lot of things that influence vaccination uptake, thinking, feeling, social processes, practical issues, to put, to, to put it very simply. And we do need a greater in investment in behavioural research, um, in cultural and social insights. Vaccination involves multiple actors, multiple systems and behaviours like antimicrobial resistance um, and stewardship does as well. Just educating people on its own has very limited impact. It can, it's in, still very important but it's not alone going to change behaviour, usually. Providers are central, and I think that's um, an issue that obviously um, antimicrobial stewardship shares as well. Providers of healthcare services are central to vaccination programs, and we need to understand and prioritise them to give the typo. COVID-19 vaccination programs will be a unique challenge, but there's already a lot of knowledge out there about how to improve vaccination rates in adults. So we need to use that and not reinvent the wheel, but adapt our knowledge. And uh, multi-component interventions work, and I'll leave you with uh, this image again of the rope climb. This is my son, it's about, I don't know, 10 years ago. And here he is sitting on all of these ropes and you can climb right up quite high, but only because there are multiple different interconnected, interconnected ropes supporting you. And if you just had a single rope or a, sing, a series of parallel ropes, it would be much more difficult. So it takes a number of different systems, structures and interventions to create change in immunisation like in any other field of preventive behaviour. Thank you.